All right. Well, it's kind of 50-50. So I'm going to go with uh, the finding and keeping good staff. I'm sorry, because um, that's what I actually had planned and have prepared for. <laughs> So um, squat, the, the leaning forward in a squat uh, thing is a topic that's coming up and I can't remember exactly when it is. It's next week or the week after or something. But um, somehow we just got our emails mixed up and sent out next week's email to you by mistake. So my apologies for that. But hopefully uh, you'll be eagerly anticipating that for another week and um, hopefully this will be valuable for you. Hey, Andrea. Nice to see you. Hey, Indy. All right. So, um, well... Who here's who here, if anyone, is an employer? Who's a studio owner or a studio manager? Anyone? All right, Andrea. Looks like looks like it's up to you. Well, I'm not that much fun because I am studio owner, and I suppose manager, but it's just me. So I don't employ anyone. <laughs> so I'm not really a good example. Well, all right. Well, you guys tell me, like, uh, you know, why, why are you here and what are you hoping to get from this conversation or what are you hoping to contribute to this conversation about uh, how to find and keep good staff? We could say from a point of being an employee what we like. Um, so, for instance, I like one of the studios a lot because we have monthly phone call-ins and they do workshops for everybody and we meet for drinks and they make you feel like you've got a community because often when you're contracting different places, you don't have a sense of community. Uh -huh. So that is really appealing for me. Huh. Thanks. What about the rest of you? Why are you here? Beck, you said you were excited about this topic. What was what was exciting for you about it? I'm just here for the ride, Raph. I just huh. want to hear what, what you got to say. But um, I've worked in a few places before that um, I know I wasn't stoked about. You know, like they'd promise things like training and that sort of stuff and it just didn't really um, ever eventuate. So I just, yeah, I think it's good to sort of be part of a conversation where people are talking about, you know, ideas that – um, could help to retain staff. Yeah. Huh. Well, uh, and a couple of you, a couple of people have uh, just joined us. So I'm sorry there were a um, couple of mixed up emails that we sent out and some of you would have received an email saying we're here to talk about uh, torso lean in a squat. Um, but whoops, sorry, that's our bad. That's actually next week's topic. So today, and today's topic is um, how to find and keep good staff. But um, up until a couple of minutes ago, there was there were no employers here, no people with staff. So is there anyone on the call now who's got staff or is looking for staff, can't find staff, has found staff, has a success story to share? Or, is, or shall we switch gears and talk about squats? All right, well, um, let's talk about squats then, shall we? So um, the topic that I posted, I believe, was how far should your torso lean forward in a squat and does it matter? Does that fit with your recollection? Is that what you're here to learn about? Well, what are your thoughts? What are your questions? What are your... What do you, what what do you understand about this presently? What would you like to understand about this? I think it slightly depends on what you're trying to achieve. Are you trying to do like a ballet style squat in a bar class where they like you to stay more upright, or are we doing more of a deadlifting kind of a squat where that's not how we could lift something? Great question. Depends why what you're trying to achieve by doing your squat. Why are you doing a squat? Probably has important implications. From memory, Raph, I um, listened to your lectures through lockdown 
having to do with center of mass and just hip structure as well, variations in that person to person. So, um, some, yeah, that's actually, actually what I, uh, was thinking of when I posted this topic is that different, um, ratios of torso length to femur length, which is your thigh bone to tibia length, which is your shin bone to ankle mobility, um, you know, different ratios of those, uh, lengths, um, mean that, you know, each of us has some different optimal amount of torso lean when we, when we squat. Yeah. So that's the basic premise behind this whole conversation from my end. And I'd like to go into more detail on that. I'm quickly racking my brains to think how I can use my model that I have, um, given that I haven't set up all my cameras for it. So I need a couple more comments from you guys or questions from you guys while I, while I think about that. What else, what else, um, would you, you know, are you curious about what, you know, what do you already know about this? Do you have any views on this already? Have you done any reading? You know, like, what do you, why is this topic of interest? question for me would be when you deadlift and are we squat, is it, is that kind of a squat or not? Does that count as a squat? Do you know what I mean? Or is that not a squat? Uh, well, I was thinking uh, particularly of an, a squat with some kind of either body weight or some kind of handheld weight, um, like a bar or, uh, a, or, you know, dumbbells or something like that, or, um, a bar on your shoulders, you know, either way. It's by, I mean, a deadlift and a squat kind of are pretty similar, slightly different range of motion for each joint. Zoe says, uh, high bar versus low bar position, pros and cons. Who knows what that means? I mean, I know you know what pros and cons means, but <laughs> do you know what high bar versus low bar means? So um, when you uh, when people squat with a barbell, um, high bar means you basically put the bar on the top of your trapezius muscle. So like basically at the base of your neck where your neck meets your shoulders, that's a high bar squat. And then a low bar squat is where you kind of jam the bar further back down. So the bar's kind of halfway down or maybe a quarter of the way down your shoulder blades, maybe it's kind of resting on your scapular spines or even a little bit lower. So it's kind of like further down your back. Um, and that's that's kind of the cool kids technique if you're an elite power lifter, you know, doing back squats with a low bar. Right, does it also have something to do with your um – your acetabular hip socket and your femoral head, like if you've got a deep socket or a shallow socket, how far um, yeah. you get down and, and not get down? Yeah, absolutely. If you've got a, you know, there's variation in people's uh, pelvic structure and people's femur, you know, thigh bone structure. And so, um, you know, the plastic skeleton models that we, that we learn on are all, exactly made off the same mold. So there, there's literally like, you know, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of these identical plastic skeleton models, you know, around the world that everyone's learning on. They are, they're all literally identical, but that's not humans. Like if you've got a hundred thousand human skeletons, no two of them would be exactly alike. They're all, you know, we're all slightly differently shaped. Um, and so people's, in reality, some people's uh, acetabulums, the hip socket, sockets face more forwards and some say face more outwards. Some are deeper and some are shallower, you know, uh, and people's femoral neck, you know, the, the femur is kind of a long bone that has a neck that kind of goes up like so. Some people's femoral neck is angled more up, some's angled more flatly, some's angled more, some are angled more forwards, some are angled more horizontally. So yeah, depending on different combinations of femoral neck you know, orientation and, and acetabulum orientation. Uh, you know, people will need to squat with knees further apart or knees closer together. Um, and if you're squatting with knees further apart, it's harder to get your bum below your hips. You know, I mean, that's, that's, uh, you know, you probably know that from your own experience that if you, you know, if you stand with your feet double shoulder width apart 
and squat, it's really hard to get your bum on the ground. <laughs> Whereas if you stand with your feet together, it's much easier to get your bum on the ground, but you tend to fall over backwards. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Pelvic shape. The, the high class term they use in the research is pelvic morphology, which is a morphology, four, four syllable word that just means shape. But they like to say it because it sounds more intellectual and stuff. All right, so I've been racking my brains and um, I think I've come up with a potential solution. So um, let's, see if, let's see how it works. It's not perfect, but it'll do. All right, so um, I'm hoping you can kind of squint your eyes and look at this and see that this looks like a human from the side. This is a foot and a shin and a thigh and a torso. If you squint your eyes a little bit till it goes a bit fuzzy, just, can you kind of see that? All right, and so this is this is a squat model that I um, I saw a guy a uh, biomechanist on YouTube using something like this, and I was like, oh, that is freaking awesome! So I asked my brother-in-law, who's a genius with metal, if he could. I sent him the video and said, oh, can you make me one of those? He's like, oh yeah. So he made me one. So um, basically, when you squat. Okay, and whether you, whether it's with a barbell or a dumbbell or deadlift or just your body weight makes really no difference. Um, you've got a center of mass, and the center of mass is just the the midpoint of your mass. You know, half of your mass is this side of the line, and half of your mass is that side of the line. You know, and it's really easy to tell where your center of mass is because if you lean too far one way or the other, you fall over, right? So you have to keep your center of mass above your feet. If it's not above your feet, you're like a table with only two legs and you fall over. So um, so when we squat as when we walk or stand or whatever, we have to keep our centre of mass above our feet. Um, and so if we take this point here to be the centre of mass, like where, the, where the, this vertical pole is, um, you know, in uh, most humans, the centre of mass is... You know, depending on your body proportion, some people have more weight in their legs, some people have more weight in their torsos, you know, it's kind of varied. But somewhere between here and here is your centre of mass. So like, you know, half of your weight is below that point and half of your weight is, you know, above that point. Um, and so, you know, we've put the centre of mass here at this point here, which is, you know, it's roughly there. Okay. Now, if you had a barbell on your shoulders, well, your centre of mass would be higher, wouldn't it? Because you have more weight on your upper body, right? But if you didn't have a barbell on your shoulders, you sent, you know, and you just were body weight, your body, your centre of mass might be a bit lower. Okay, so it's kind of it varies. So, as this person squats down, and we'll call this an average person, okay, we well, can see that their their hip has to go backwards in order for their torso to get down, because if the hip doesn't go backwards, the torso comes forwards, you know. So in order for the torso to stay in line with the center of mass, the hip's got to go backwards. On the other hand, if we reduce their ankle mobility, say, by adjusting my little screw here, So now this person's been told, keep your knees behind your toes at all times, okay? Well, you can see that as that person now squats down, their knee doesn't go as far forward, therefore their hips go more backward, therefore they achieve a more horizontal torso position, right? Because if, they, if their torso was more upright, they, their centre of mass would be behind their base of support. Does that make sense to you? So this is a squat, and this person, that's as deep as it can go, right? Because to go any deeper, their centre of mass goes beyond the midpoint and they'll fall over backwards. So this, it physically, it, it won't go any lower, okay? So that's as low as that person can go, and it's not because of hip mobility or any other thing, it's because of they're, they're keeping their knees behind their toes. 
and you, you, you can just see if I reduce that, this thing's more designed to be operated on a table. So, Raf, would that be the situation with someone who has um, restriction in their ankle joint? They would therefore have to lean further forward yes. to get down in their squat? And you can do a simple experiment with yourself for that. Like if you squat in flat shoes or bare feet, okay, see how low you can go without falling backwards. Okay, and then if you stick your heels up on a, a foam block or, you know, one inch thick wedge or something like that, and so your heels are raised an inch, you can, you'll definitely be able to squat lower without falling over backwards. You know, like as you squat down body weight, you know, you need to stick your arms out forward most of the time so that you don't overbalance backwards. What I'm saying is with your heels raised up, you can go further down with less arm movement. And that's because your knees go further forwards. Okay, so now if we increase the distance that the knees can go forwards here, okay, as we squat down, we can keep an almost vertical torso, okay, and go a lot deeper, okay, because there's more ankle dorsiflexion, therefore more forward knee travel, therefore the centre of mass is further forward, therefore the butt doesn't have to go as far backward, oh, sorry, therefore the torso doesn't have to go as far forward to compensate. The butt's not going as far backward, therefore the torso doesn't have to go as far back, as far forward. Okay, so, and if we simply take the knee backward, you can just see here, as we take the knee back in space, the hip goes back in space, and the torso has to lean forwards to compensate. Okay, and so for somebody keeping their shins vertical, that's their deepest possible squat. I mean, try it sometime. Like, try keeping your shins vertical and see how deep you can go without holding on to something to stop you falling over. So does that concept make sense that like it's it it might be ankle mobility for this person or it might just be that they've been told, you know, don't let your knees go forward in your squat. Does that concept make sense to you? Do you have any other questions about that? No, but that's a neat little contraption you have there. Freaking pretty awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I tell you though, it weighs a ton. This is a good shoulder workout. All right, so now this person's got what I would consider to be, you know, more like, you know, average-ish ankle mobility. You know, most people's knees go roughly kind of sort of that far forwards, okay? Um, but what if we give them longer femurs? So we can actually... Whoop, that's better if I get a leg involved. Can actually make the femur a bit longer there. All right now, no one's in real life got a femur that's like you know double the length <laughs> of the average femur, okay, compared to their tibia. But you know, just to illustrate a point, okay. So if we make the femur longer, and then we squat down, what we find is because now the femur's longer, well, the butt is further back in space. Right, therefore the weight goes further back in space, therefore the torso needs to lean more forwards. Right, and therefore that is as deep as that person can squat because if they go any deeper, they'll fall over backwards. So if you're blessed with long femurs, you know, not long thigh bones relative to your tibias, well, your squat is going to look more like that. Okay. Whereas if you want to be an elite Olympic weightlifter, okay, and squat really deep, well, you're going to have to choose parents who've got short femurs so that you can squat like that. Now, have you, you, you must have seen or even thought about, I mean, you've, you know, many of you have got young kids or been around young kids. And you must have noticed that young kids, like, you know, two, three, four years old, they can squat beautifully, can't they? I mean, they just squat down so their bums are sitting on the ground. They can sit there for like hours just playing, you know, digging in the garden or whatever in this perfect, you know, deep, 
you know, bum to grass sort of squat. Um, and, you know, for years I used to think like, oh, that's because I've got such excellent hip mobility and it's, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could regain that hip mobility? And then I read a paper a couple of years ago that like gave me brain explosion emoji that said two things. One, young kids at that age have much shorter arms and legs relative to their torsos. Right. And number two, they have way huge heads. Their heads are gigantic, right? Little kids relative to their body size, their head is like <laughs> jumbo sized. So their center of mass is really high because of this ginormous head, right? And they've got these little short thighs, okay? And those the combination of those two things, short thighs and a high center of mass, so that allows them to get into this deep squat position, right? So if I take the center of mass, center of mass up now near the shoulder here, right? Like I'm a two-year-old kid with a oversized head on me, okay? Well, look how deep I can get into this squat now, you know, very comfortably, right? Whereas if I now take the center of mass lower, so maybe I've got, I've got a heavier lower body relative to my upper body, without changing femur length or ankle mobility or anything, just the center of mass changing means that, of course, I have to lean further forwards in order to keep my center of mass directly above my feet. Right? And so again, if we take the center of mass higher on the torso, we can squat deeper. Right? So when you see those little you know, three-year-olds squatting and, you know, perfectly, now, just know it's because they've got freaking monster heads. That's why they can do it. <laughs> it's, it's not because of some, like, superior, you know, thing. I mean, sure, being able to suck your toes probably doesn't hurt <laughs> how deep you can squat. <laughs> but uh, it's having short femurs and a big head that's the real, <laughs> the real uh, you know, one weird trick to uh, squat deep if you're a three-year-old. So, um, yeah, so... Any any thoughts or questions on that at this point? Does that does that kind of make sense to you? Yeah, I wanted to ask and also add in. Um, so I can't remember who posted this. I saw this on Instagram, but it, they're a physical therapist who's very strongly evidence based, and um, they raised the question of why are we completely obsessed when with constantly squatting in a neutral spine all the time when we're not under intense load. And I wanted to like, just comment that if you look at little kids, when they squat, there's no obsession with perfect neutral wow. spine. There's lumbar flexion. It is neutral spine when you're not under, you know, a, a load. Is that even important as important as we think? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a whole long conversation. Um, and you're exactly right, Cynthia, that, you know, young kids have absolutely nil consciousness of their, spinal, you know, alignment, you know, when they're moving, they just move how they feel. And um, uh, actually, even elite Olympic weightlifters, you know, so the people that you look at and go, oh my God, you've got such a beautiful straight spine when you squat deep. Actually, there are a few uh, laboratory experiments where they get those people like elite lifters into the laboratory and say, okay, squat deep. And they put inclinometers on their, you know, on their sacrum and on their T12, you know, the bottom of the thoracic spine, and they measure that they're basically alignment of lumbar. And what they find is even the most elite lifters, when they're specifically coached to keep neutral spine, they flex their lumbar spine in the bottom of a squat somewhere between like 20 and 40 degrees, you know, which is a lot, you know, it's a lot of flexion. Um, and even when they look, you know, straight, actually the, um, I'm not sure how far we're going to go into this digression, but it's an interesting concept. All right. So you guys can see this, this spine, right? Awesome. All right. So we're looking at the lumbar spine. So here's the sacrum. Here's the L5. Let me look a bit more professional here. Here's the sacrum. Here's the L5, L4, L3, L2, L1. Okay. There's the T12. That's the bottom of the thoracic spine. Super professional. Hey, this is a knitting needle. I ordered it off uh, eBay. You get them in pairs. I'm not sure, I don't know anything about knitting, so I'm not sure what you could knit with these, but they make marvellous pointers. 
Actually, I've ordered a lot of pointers, and none of the pointers were anywhere near as good as pointers as these knitting needles are as pointers. So anyway. Um, so there's your lumbar spine, L54321. Okay. And if you look closely, what you'll be able to see is these spinous processes are not all the same length. They're not all the same length. Okay. Uh, and so when, when we make the lumbar spine flat here, okay, it kind of looks a little bit flexed here. Like this, these two are longer. Can you see that? So this is flat here, okay? But this is, you know, there's a slight curve around here. So what we see on the outside doesn't necessarily mirror actually the alignment of the vertebral bodies, I guess is the, the take home message there. So when we look at someone and say, oh, they're nice and straight or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean, and, and of course, there's variation in between people in the lengths of their spinous processes, right? So some people have got longer spinous processes, some people have less long. Some people have their L3 and 4, sorry, L2 and 3 spinous processes longer than average, and other people have it, them shorter than average, you know, relative to the L1, the L4, and the L5, for example. So just looking at how flat someone's back is doesn't necessarily give you any kind of reliable indicator of, of the position of their vertebral bodies, you know, whether in lordosis or neutral or, or whatever. Yeah, so um, I'm pleased I, got, pleased I got to use my overhead camera and my knitting needles. Um, so, yeah, so kids kids uh, don't really squat with a consciousness of uh, neutral spine and even uh, very elite lifters, when they lift, uh, you know, squat deep, tend to, or not tend to, invariably flex their spine, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 degrees. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a, an open question of like, okay, well, if you can't, if, if we, if it's not possible to keep neutral spine, you know, what's all the fuss about sort of thing. Raphael, can I comment on that, please? Please, please. Jim, great to have you with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm just sticky beat and interesting to see, interested to see what the real world views compared to a academic so hey um can i just briefly jim uh introduce you jim was one of my uh lecturers at, in my undergraduate degree at in exercise science at charles darwin uni so jim's a very knowledgeable fellow and he I, your, I, your uh, I about that. your job consists of sticking uh sensors on people and getting them to move and then measuring how much they're moving like you were doing uh, that swimming uh project where you were putting sensors on people's thorax and, and measuring their rotation, weren't you? Yes. Yes, exactly. Well, that was one of the many things. Um, <laughs> after you coming through, uh, one of my students that went on to do a PhD uh, actually used sensors for measuring um, posture during lifting huh. uh, to take it out into the workplace situation environment. So uh, there's a little bit of overlap here with that. but. Relative to neutral spine and so forth, it's just, I think it's worth for people to keep bear in mind the kids are highly flexible and elite athletes are highly trained. So you've got two opposite extremes and the general public tend not to, excuse me, I've got, as soon as I start talking, the phone rings. But, um, uh, but anyway, um, the, 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 People's uh, intervertebral discs are not conditioned for it, so you have to be careful of, of, of encouraging people to flex their spine because theoretically the vertebra are meant to be parallel to one another and, you know, they're designed that as they curve that the, that the discs, um, uh, uh, the, the vertebra, sorry, are not parallel the top of the vertebra to the, the uh underside of the vertebra and they're slightly um, wedge shape so the discs remain parallel uh, and that's that's the concept behind or the concept the principle within the gives us that curvature of the spine and having people uh, flex their spine and they're not conditioned to do it 
you could have their discs herniated or, or, or be injured in some way or another. So it's just a comment of being very careful. I'm not saying don't do it, but just be very mindful that of, of what can result um, if if some old fart like me goes and tries to to flex my spine and and then I end up doing a disc or something like that. It's 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 you know it's it's my it's being mindful of what who your clients are. And I'll shut up there. So. Hey Jim, thanks so much. It's so awesome to have you on the on the call. And it's great to see you. I, I haven't seen you for a few years now since since I graduated. And so it's really yeah. great to have you. Yeah, well thank you. Am I allowed to embarrass you? Oh well, it's not preferred, but you know, you're you're your own person. <laughs> when I first come up here and I was doing functional anatomy, uh, which is one of the subjects I teach, I had an assignment that I, I've told Raphael this before, but I had an assignment and I the, the quality of the work was so high, the quality of the writing and, and what had been uh, referenced and how it was referenced and how it was written, I was convinced that there was plagiarism, that, that it wasn't uh, the student's own work. And I hunted and hunted and hunted and tried to find the, the information where it was taken from and I couldn't. So I gave up and I marked the, the student appropriately, which was a very high mark. Come to the end of semester exams where there's no access to books or anything, same type of work came out with references, uh, and I was blown away, and that was Raphael. I've never seen it before. Uh, I've never seen it since. Uh, so you've got a guy here that's highly, highly capable, uh, and, you know, what he says I think you should take um, uh, notice of considerably. So there, there you go, Raphael. I've, hmm. I've, I've blown your trumpet for you, but uh, it's it's – yeah, it's, it's incredible. I keep telling people about it now because it still amazes me what you did. <laughs> well, of all the embarrassing things you could say, that wasn't that wasn't that bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell them about the time I wet my pants in class or anything like that, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what about the rest of you guys? Uh, anything, you know, any uh, questions, thoughts, input? Uh, has that sparked, you know, any trains of thought for you going to be encouraging your clients to squat like babies maybe grow a shorter torso shorter femurs I'll, I'll ask one question then if, if no one else is just, just as a point of interest to see what people come up with, what you're saying about young children and, and, and so forth being able to squat naturally and the explanation of it was a very good explanation. It hadn't even occurred to me before, so I learned something there. But our inability to squat seems to be more prevalent in Western societies and Western cultures and in other parts of the world you see people right through their whole lifespan squatting, um, you know, squat to talk rather than sit on chairs to talk. What's your thoughts there? Um, well, I haven't seen research on this, but I've seen Stu McGill um, present a bunch of times on this topic. Um, he's a professor of biomechanics at Waterloo. Actually, he's emeritus professor now of biomechanics at Waterloo University in Ontario, Canada. Uh, and he's um, got he's got a collection of uh, femurs and pelvises that he – drags out or actually he's got photographs of them that he displays and um, his theory, and I don't know if he's got research, epidemiological research on this or whether it's just kind of, you know, his observation um, is that um, people of different ethnic, uh, you know, descent basically have predis, you know, like if you look at say people from Thailand versus people from, a, you know, um, I don't know, Australia, you know, like Caucasian people born in Australia for generations, there are many physical differences, you know, height, weight, you know, et cetera, um, 
amongst those, you know, between those people. And so Stu McGill's theory is that, you know, there there are also sort of genetic differences in the acetabular orientation and depth, you know, so the depth and 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 direction that the hip socket faces in. And uh, he reckons that um, certain ethnic groups, so he thinks Asian people and Eastern European people tend to have more shallow forward-facing hip sockets. And he thinks Western Europeans and basically Caucasians tend to have more, you know, deep and lateral facing hip sockets. Um, and, uh, you know, he trots out a couple of, like I said, a couple of pelvises to, <laughs> as examples. Um, but he says like, you know, name a great, you know, Olympic weightlifting champion from Scotland in the last hundred years, you know, like there isn't one, right? Whereas if you name one from like Romania or the you know, the Czech Republic or China. It's like there's dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Um, uh, and so, you know, so his, his theory is that basically, you know, certain ethnic, you know, basically genetic, you know, inheritance dictates that you've got shallow forward-facing hip sockets where you can squat deep with your knees close together and keep your spine straight and your center of mass above your feet without falling over backwards, which is awesome if you want to be an Olympic weightlifting champion but it probably uh, also predisposes you to, you know, hip injuries in a deep yoga pose, you know, um, and stuff. Because you've got that sort of additional mobility, you probably, you know, have less um, structural integrity in that joint, you know, at extreme positions. And so he, you know, his theory is that that's why we we're never going to see a, you know, a rash of squat, Scottish, you know, Olympic weightlifting champions. But that those, you know, those Scottish people with sturdy hips, you know, for striding the highlands, they they produce, you know, maximum torque at a shallow angle of hip flexion, you know. So when they're basically in that kind of this position here, where you're kind of in a quarter squat, you know, which is basically the position of athletic, you know, when you're running or playing football or whatever, it's like that's the, the crouched, semi-crouched position. That's the position of maximum torque, you know, for people with a deeper hip socket. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I kind of like that idea. I think it's it makes sense to me, but I haven't seen any research. I've just seen some really cool looking slides with people's femurs with different length femoral necks. You know, people with really long femoral necks. It's like, well, their their greater trochanter is going to bump into the the pelvis, you know, <laughs> earlier, you know, during hip flexion or hip abduction. So yeah, I think I mean it. it I can't. It just seems very plausible to me that explanation. Have you come across that? I haven't, I haven't looked into it myself very much. I'm actually at the moment, uh, I'm doing a lot of early, uh, early human uh, hominid and hominid um, uh, uh, literature searches and so forth to try and find it. And that it sort of fits. It doesn't fit in exactly what you're saying, but what, how the hip and the pelvis. Um, and the femur have evolved uh, for low bearing, for standing upright and so forth. Is, is, um, what you've just explained fits into the to a lot of the literature that what I've been reading about. Yeah, so, I've actually yeah. got a couple of slides on it here. Um, all right, let's see if we can open those up. All right, there we go. It's almost like I prepared this earlier. I did, but this wasn't what I was going to present today. This is something I created for a course I did a year or two ago. So um, I'm not going to give you the whole lecture, but basically, yeah, humans are different shapes. See, uh, this is this is a great. I love this series. Uh, incidentally. Um, and you may have seen this, some of you, like this is, these are all Olympic athletes, like literally people who were in the Olympics, right? Obviously for different sports, you know, like <laughs> you look at those people and, and you could probably guess which ones were the gymnasts, you know, which ones were the, the speed and power athletes, you know, like the shot putters or the, you know, the hundred meter sprinters. Okay. 
which ones are the marathon runners, which ones are the basketballers. You know, you could probably take a reasonable guess at just based on their body shape, right? And some of them have got their sumo wrestling gear on, so that's a bit of a giveaway. But isn't it amazing? These people are all elite athletes. Look how different their body shapes are. It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, I showed this to my daughter like every night when I read her to bed, you know, when she was little, um, because I just think it's wonderful. Um, Anyway, I mean, look at those, you know, those, they, I'm assuming they're Kenyan elite distance runners there, because that's basically all elite distance runners are Kenyan these days. Um, look at look at their frame compared to, you know, these people here of this lady. I'm going to assume I don't I don't have direct memory, but I'm going to assume she's a, maybe a sprinter or some kind of you know strength and power athlete, speed and power athlete. And then if we look at the these little Kenyan guys look like that you could snap them in half with you between your thumb and finger, but they can run at 21 kilometers an hour, you know, for two hours straight, which is just almost inconceivable to me. Anyway, I digress. Um, so, uh, so every aspect of human body shows variation. We're all different. Those, these people are also Olympic athletes. This woman's a weightlifter. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, I mean, she can lift like two and a half times her body weight above her head, you know, which is just insane. Anyway, um, so the this is, I just stole these from Stu McGill's presentation. He stole them from somewhere else. So I felt justified in that. Um, but look at this. You can see these these pelvises are aligned, you know, in, to the camera identically. And you can see the acetabulum, the hip socket here versus here. This one is so much more lateral. It's facing so much more sideways, whereas this one is so much you know, more orient, oriented, so much more anteriorly. It's pointing forwards, basically. Right? Can you guys see that? Like how, how the difference in, in the alignment of those hip sockets? Um, and like you, this is just this is from the um, you know, from the front view, those same two pelvises. Like you can't even see any part of the socket on this one because it's facing so sideways, it's hidden. Whereas this one, you can basically see just about the whole socket, you know, it's facing, you know, completely forwards just about, or not completely, but, you know, much more forwards. Um, uh, yeah, so the, 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 the orientation also, these ones are, fa- you know, if you look at the, the center, if this was like a ray gun, you know, with, on the Death Star, you know, it would face out this way, okay, whereas this one, faces more downwards. Right, can you see that the orientation, I'm not sure how good the quality of the image is that you're receiving over, you know, over the video, but um, hopefully you can see that this one, you know, the shape of it is like that, okay, whereas this one, the shape of it is like that. You know, it, it faces more sideways, this one faces more downwards. And so if you've got hip sockets that face more downwards, well, if you bring the leg up that way, it's going to bump into the pelvis, you know, into the edge of the, the labrum or the hip socket much quicker. Um, this, this is, these are different uh, hip sockets, but look, you know, look how deep this one is, okay, that's compared to that one. So this is basically a half sphere or even a slightly more than a half sphere, whereas this is, you know, maybe a quarter sphere, if that. So get you know who's one of these hips is going to be much more mobile, and one of them is going to be much more stable. Not the same ones though. Uh, and these are femurs from the top view. Okay, so this is the femoral shaft, the body of the bone from the top view. This is the femoral neck here, and this is the femoral head. That's the ball of the ball and socket. And you can see, uh, whoops, do that just about once every presentation because the delete key is right next to the remove the red writing key. Um, uh, and you can see that they've aligned the femoral condyle. So here are the bottom parts of the femur here. That, those are the two sort of outside bones of your knee. Okay, they've aligned them so that both, of, believe it or not, both of these femurs are facing this way. Right? So this would, if, this, if these were in a living person, their kneecap would both be facing directly forwards. But look at the angle of the femoral neck here. I mean, that's quite a dramatic, you know, difference, right? 
And so, you know, one of these people is going to have a lot more turnout than the other one. And one of them is going to be, you know, their ballet teacher hitting him on the back with a willow switch, you know, every lesson going, you know, turn out from the hips more, not from the knees. And they're going, I can't. And yeah, it's, it's true, they can't because their, their legs face more sideways, right? Whereas this person, when they're standing, you know, with their legs forward, they're already, you know, they're, they're, they're already turned out a bit there, man, in the hip. Um, and the angle of the femoral neck relative to the vertical, you know, this one's more horizontal, this one's, you know, more vertical, in a more vertical direction. Uh, the length of the femoral neck, this is a short femoral neck, much longer femoral neck. Okay, so all of these things, like if you've got a, you know, a hip socket here, okay, and then a pelvis, hip socket here, and then a pelvis, well, this longer femoral neck, as you abduct, this is going to bang into there a lot quicker. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's one of the many reasons why people don't squat the same, I reckon. But don't have any research on it. Sorry, no citations. But I do have a citation on the baby head thing. Would you like to see the baby head citation? It's got photos as well. Not photos, but... Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find it because I couldn't find it when searching for head. So maybe actually, maybe I do have something down here. Uh, I don't think... Oh, yes, I do. I, I've got a citation. This is from uh, Huelke, 1998, an overview of anatomical considerations of infants and children in the adult world of, world of automid, automobile safety design. So this was... They were looking at, like, you know, seatbelt design and stuff in cars and, you know, how, how, how high to make the seatbelt so it didn't decapitate kids, presumably. But what they found incidentally was... Look at the proportion of height taken up by the head of a newborn <laughs> compared to an adult, right? Newborns are all head. Isn't that amazing? And look at the length of their legs, you know, of a newborn relative to an adult. So newborns have way bigger legs and, oh, sorry, way bigger heads and way shorter legs than adults, shorter femurs. The tibias are not that much shorter. So isn't that interesting? Maybe I've got a photo of a kid squatting here, yeah. yeah. See a short little femurs in a big head? All right, anyway. So, thanks thanks for that digression, Zoe and, and Jim. Well, I think it was Zoe who brought up the socket thing if it wasn't apologies to whoever it was yeah uh yeah zoe says uh yeah a bunch of people have said yeah mel says you get good at what you practice 100 percent um and there is there was that recent uh systematic review that came out only this year uh the name of the author escapes me um but i'll post it in the in the comments under the video when we do the the facebook uh uh, we, we post the recording in Facebook. There was a, a systematic review of strength training um, compared to stretching for range of motion. They found that strength training done through full range of motion results in the same increase in range of motion as stretching. And so absolutely, you know, if you regularly squat, you know, with body weight or you know, weights or whatever, well, you're going to get better at squatting deep because you're body's going to adapt to those, you know, extended you know, muscle lengths and, and joint positions. Um, uh, and Zoe says, Does, do yogis have more hip problems? And actually, I do have an answer to that. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But uh, let me just look it up. I've got a paper here called... Let's 
Let's see if I can get this down here. Not sure if I can. All right, I'll just read it to you. It's called Injury and Yoga Asana Practice Assessment of the Risks by Weiss et al. Uh, 2019. And what they said, uh, they studied a total of 2,620 participants in yoga. Uh, they found the number of injuries reported by yoga participants per years of practice exposure to be low and the occurrence of serious injuries in yoga to be infrequent compared to other physical activities suggesting that yoga is not a high-risk activity. So good news for the yogis in the room. Um, and I think they said uh, they said the most common injury, so overall injuries in yoga are uncommon. So go do yoga if you like yoga. Um, but if you do get injured in yoga, you're likely to get injured in the knee, the low back, the sh or the shoulder. So there you go. Now, that doesn't mean that you're if you do yoga, all of a sudden you're immune to hip injuries. It just means that statistically, you know, if you had to roll a dice a thousand times, you know, chances are if you did get an injury, well, you probably wouldn't get an injury doing yoga. And if you did, it's more likely to be in the shoulder, the knee, or the what did they say, low back. Yeah, so the answer to that question is, do yogis, uh, the question, do yogis uh, get more hip injuries? The answer is, no, they don't. Yeah. But they, they do believe in weird things more than the average, I think. You know, like full moons and chakras and stuff like that. But I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think that's got anything to do with injury. Raf, um, I understand if there's no time for one more question. Um, I just wanted to like loop it back around to, you know, like in the context of teaching a Pilates class, be it reformer or mat, where you're not really doing heavy weights. If anything, you've got like two pink 500 gram hand weights at best, right? Um, when you are getting your participants to squat, like I'm just very challenged with how, how we tend to cue after listening to your podcast, obsessing over like neutral, 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 neutral. Whereas if everyone squats differently, would it be better to cue externally? Like how, how low can you comfortably go? Do, do you know what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. Like how to cue it without applying the same technique template to every single person in the room, given there's no risk with excessive load? Yeah. So if, you, if you're using the 500 gram, you know, pink hand weights, and it's important that they're pink um, uh, because otherwise they'll bulk you up. You know, if we made them black, for example, um, uh, I would uh, be tempted to not cue technique. I would just be tempted to say, okay, let yeah, something like you know, see how low you can go, something like that, or see how low you can go, uh, um, you know, with a you know sm small to degree of discomfort. Um, or I might not even say how low you can go. I just might even just say, hey, Scott, because there's not like an inherent benefit to going lower. Like, yes, you will increase your mobility more by going lower. Uh, so, you you know, if you go lower, you'll get better at going lower. Um, yes, you will probably slightly enhance strength and muscle growth by working at longer ranges of motion. Um, there was a systematic review recently that looked at, at that and found that exercise that included long muscle lengths, you know, led to slightly better strength and uh, hypertrophy or muscle growth um, outcomes than, than exercises that didn't include long muscle lengths. So I'd say, you know, there's, my default would always be like, okay, if we can do so, um, you know, without pain or freaking out, you know, let's, let's go full range. But, you know, the, the, the amount of benefit is not massive. It's, you know, it's like, okay, if you're an elite athlete and every 
you know, a quarter of a percent is going to the difference between gold and fourth place, well, yes, you know, it really makes a difference. But if you're someone who does, you know, two 45-minute Pilates classes a week and you're, you know, realising 15% of your maximum physical potential, well, adding another quarter of a percent, you know, one way or the other doesn't really make much difference. So I'll just say like, well, you know, do it however you want to do it. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you're going to ask me how to do it, I would say let's go as deep as possible. Thank you. I just, I had clients with mothers who just want to be able to bend down and pick up their child. Yeah. And this question actually came up with a mother saying, I can't pick my, pick up my child with a perfect neutral spine. Like I no, need to just can't. sit down and pick them up how I pick them up. And yeah, so that escalated this train of thought. Thank you. Yeah. Well, if you, if you look at, and I, you know, I don't have time to look up the studies on this. I've got them though. Maybe I'll just see if I can dig a couple out and put them in the, 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 the comments in the, when we post in Facebook. But if, if we look at ecological, um, like observational studies where we basically just go and look at workers working, you know, um, and see how they lift, uh, what we find is that people uh, uh, basically use what's called a stoop lifting strategy by default. You know, so if, we, if we're not telling people how to lift, if we just say, if we just like be a fly on the wall whilst they're, they're working in a factory environment or whatever, um, the majority of people adopt a stoop lifting strategy, which is basically you keep your legs relatively straight and you kind of bend at the hip and the back, you know, so you kind of like that, um, as opposed to a squat strategy. I mean, I think, you know, if you, if you think about like, if you walk home, you know, come into your lounge room and the kids have left something on the floor, you go to pick it up. Well, you know, unless you're really consciously thinking about it, you probably just bend at the hip, right, to and reach down to get it rather than kind of squatting down. Um, you know, well, statistically, that's what the evidence suggests anyway. So, yeah. Beck? Um, with uh, Ruff and, and Jim, what you were talking about earlier as well, um, wouldn't it also potentially be less about the position, you know, biomechanics about, you know, <laughs> relation to how you're squatting and more about progressively loading to build your tolerance regardless of the position that you're in you know I mean whether we're talking about in a Pilates setting or whether we're talking about actually lifting um you know heavy things uh when you're thinking about you know potentially um the potential for injury is it less about how you know what your posture is in that position and more about incrementally building yourself up to be able to tolerate certain loads, regard, you know, regardless. Jim, do you have a view you'd like to share on this? Um, yeah, I will. Uh, and then I'll have to go because I'm actually meant to be in another meeting now already, but this has interested me so much I, <laughs> I've hung around for too long. But, um, uh, yes, to both. Uh, essentially, um, it's I'll as you were as you were asking the question back. I, I was thinking of a study that was done a number of. Oh, I don't think it was a study. Uh, I don't think it was published, but there was some people looking at um, the effects of powerlifting and what it had done on the spine and the vertebra, and they got the Australian powerlifting champion and they did an MRI of his spine and they had anticipated that his vertebra would be all compressed and squashed and, 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 and essentially mangled from all the heavy lifting that he did. But it turned out that his, his intervertebral discs were as close as what they've seen of anyone to the ideal models, the, 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 the model of the ideal um, distance of, of or, or, or the size of the intervertebral discs. So it was indications and what they concluded was was that the exercise and done properly and appropriately stimulated the the um, uh, the, the discs to to maintain their integrity as, as how they should be. But that would have been just through building up over time. Over decades. Um, yeah. yeah, certainly. So 
yeah, but I better rush because I am very late now for this meeting. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Raphael. Great to so, see you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for your input. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, Beck, I'm going to ag- agree furiously with Jim there that um, I haven't – I'm interested. I'm going to try and track down that study now. Um, but uh, everything I've read – so we, we actually – we know that um, elite power, we've only got indirect evidence on this, you know, and I think it's fair to say that it's an open question and that there are strong views held by intelligent people on both sides of the question. Uh, my view falls on the side of like, it, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very unconvinced that alignment makes much difference to your injury risk. Um, we have, uh, you know, a few indirect lines of evidence that I find pretty compelling. One is that, uh, like I said before, we've got very, you know, quite a few studies. I can think of three or four studies off the top of my head of elite uh, powerlifters and weightlifters showing that when they lift, uh, you know, approach, you know, maximum lifts, like above 90% of them maximum, that everybody adopts us a flexed spine strategy. Um, and that, we know that powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting are very safe sports. Like the incidence of injuries in those sports is very, very low. It's like up right up there with ballroom dancing. You know, it's, it's, they're very, very safe sports. Uh, if you want to do a dangerous sport, try netball. Netball is freaking intensely dangerous. You blow out your knee just because <laughs> you catch the ball, stop, change direction. Um, uh, so yeah, so we know that, that powerlifters particularly flex their spine a bit and it's a very safe sport. Um, also, we've got some of those, those lab experiments from the early 2000s from McGill and Callahan, and there's some some from the, the mid-2010s from Guyas and Dolan and Kingma, which all basically are sort of lab studies where they look at spine segments in jigs and, you know, compress them and bend them or whatever. What they find is that uh, compression is the main predictor of, of disc uh, or vertebral injury. Um, so, you know, more force equals more chance of injury, basically, regardless of the alignment. But the alignment predicts the location of the injury. So like Jim said before, if you flex, you're more likely to damage your disc, right? But you're not more likely to get injured because if you don't flex, you're less likely to damage your disc, but you're more likely to damage your end plate, which is the, the end of the vertebra, you know, the top or the bottom part of the vertebra where it uh, joins onto the disc. So, Bending or not bending doesn't change your injury risk, uh, as you know. As I read the evidence, it changes which part of you is more likely to get injured if you do get injured, right? So if you lift, you know what what I think what causes injury risk is lifting too much, <laughs> you know, putting too much load through the system that you're not not uh, you haven't built a tolerance for. Um, so, uh, but and when you do put too much load through the system, whether you're bent or straight determines which part is going to get injured right but it, but you're going to get injured regardless if you if you well, not going to but it's like you're more likely to get injured regardless if you you know exceed your current load capacity so basically what jim said and what a bunch of you have said as well build it up gradually over time build up a tolerance to it build up a tolerance to load in the position that you're going to be loaded you know because when you flex more you load the disc well relatively and when you flex less you learn the end plate so if you practice in a in a straight spine you build up stronger end, end plates right whereas if you practice more in a bent spine you build up stronger discs so you know whatever you want to build up tolerance for you've got to practice doing that exact movement you know but you've got to start small and gradually build it up because these tissues take you know months and years to adapt you know not days and weeks yeah. Great, great uh, questions, great input. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm sorry about the mix-up with the topics, um, and I'm sorry I didn't have, as a consequence, my camera's set up to use my spine model, but don't worry, my shoulders have got a great workout as a result, so that was awesome. Um, And uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week.